I'm an atheist, and atheism is not a positive philosophy. It's not a moral system. It's not a political or economic. It's none of that. Atheism is simply the absence of a belief in God. That's all it is. Atheism doesn't pretend to make you a better person. All it is is a person who says, wait a minute, I don't have a reason to believe. For the same reason, I am an a-leprechaunist. I can't prove to you that there are no leprechauns. Can any of you prove there are leprechauns? There might be. Can any of you prove with 100%? But how many of you believe in leprechauns? You're all a-leprechaunists, even though you can't prove it. Well, very few atheists will tell you, I can prove there's no God. What we say is that the likelihood of the existence of God is so low, maybe 5%, maybe, you know, and we're open. Of course, I'm open. I would gladly change my mind. But it is so low that we can safely round it off. Atheism is negative, of course, because it's not theism. It's not the belief in theism, but it's a double negative. Other double negatives that are positive words are words like independence. Independence is not something, and yet we view it as a positive thing. Atheism is positive, it is reasonable, it is, uh, it is a good position to have. Intelligent people have thought about it. Believers like me who used to believe have thought it through and realized that the arguments that we thought were so precious are really, are really bad. The most important question you can ask about any claim, especially a religious claim, is, is it true? Not, does it make me feel good? Not, does it answer some God of the gap arguments? Not, is it useful? Not, does it give a social cohesion? But is it true? Is it actually true? We wouldn't be having this debate tonight if the existence of God were actually true. Think about it. By now, somebody should have won the Nobel Prize for bringing forth the evidence for a God, right? If there's evidence there, where's the beef? Where's the evidence? Any scientist in the world would love a chance to say, here it is, folks, there's the evidence, we've got it. Instead, what we have are negative arguments. We have arguments that are called God of the gaps, which is what Adam gave you tonight. He didn't give us anything positive, he gave us negatives. It's the same argument that the ancients used to use when they heard thunder and lightning. I can't explain that. What is that noise and light? It must be some big animal, agent, thing, person, whatever, super thing up there. Let's call it Thor. In fact, we even have a day of the week named after that God, right? We don't have a Jesus day or a Muhammad day. We have a Thursday. But actually, that was a gap in their understanding. And when we learn about electricity, when we learn about weather patterns, that gap closed and that God disappeared. Someday, um, the gaps can and will and probably if science continues like it has been. And who's, who is Adam to say that we have reached the end of science? When those gaps close, I hope that Adam will be honest enough to say, oh, I guess my God of the gaps doesn't exist. Thor is now right into the trash bin along with Jesus and Yahweh and Allah. It's because we don't need those explanations anymore. There's no evidence for a God, positive ev evidence for the God. You only have these negative arguments that you can plug the gap with. Holy books like the Quran and the Bible are not reliable books. Both of those books have some wonderful writing in them. Both of them have some jewels. But Thomas Jefferson said when he went through the Bible, it was like looking for a diamond in a dunghill. He found some diamonds. He did. He found some beautiful things. And when I read through the Quran again, um, I found some amazing passages in here, I, some impressive writing, some what I would call poetic literature that uh, really stands out. I see the same thing in the Bible. I see the same thing in, in other writings in the, around, in the world too. Uh, the fact that this book is unique doesn't mean it's true. I've read a lot of writing by authors who have very unique styles. That doesn't mean it's great because it's unique, because it's different, right? In fact, a lot of people say the New Testament documents were written in a strange Koine Greek style that no other legendary sources have ever used. Therefore, that proves the gospel stories of Jesus and his being the Son of God must be true because it's unique. Well, that's a, that's a phony argument. When you look at the Bible and the Quran, you find contradictions. You find uh, anachronisms. Uh, there's a whole lot of repetition in here, a lot of tiresome repetition, especially about the pangs of hell. I mean, you, over and over and over and over again, we're reminded about how we're going to burn. And not only that, but God's going to grow your skin back so he can burn it off again. I mean, you know, and we're supposed to admire that book? I mean, there's a lot of that stuff in there. But in any event, I found that the Bible that I used to believe is not a dependable book. It's uh, the mistakes, the anachronisms, the in fact, there's much moral advice in there which I find morally repugnant on good grounds. Third, no one has ever given a coherent definition 
of a god. Adam didn't define a god, but usually if you try to define God in, with these characteristics that believers try to tell us this being exists, when we ask them, please tell me what are we arguing for here, well they give definitions of characteristics that actually are mutually incompatible. For example, this is a simplistic example, um, if God were defined as a married bachelor, right? I debated Hassanayn Rajabali in Queens uh, um, at the Islamic Center there a few years ago, and he defined God as uh, infinitely merciful and infinitely just. All merciful and all just. Well, such a being is a married bachelor. It cannot exist. If God is infinitely merciful, then he cannot be just. Because what, is, what does mercy mean? Mercy means that you dispense a punishment or a sentence with less severity than is deserved by the crime. That's what mercy means. What is justice? Justice is getting the sentence and the punishment at exactly what's deserved. You don't send a little child to prison for stealing cookies, right? That's unjust. But you find a punishment that fits the crime, right? So if God is infinitely merciful, he can never be ever just because justice and mercy conflict with each other. That's just one example, and there are many others. For example, I have an argument called Fang, the free will argument for the non-existence of God, which um, it's, it takes a little time to explain it, but basically, uh, if you know the future, then you, you don't have free will. If God is defined as a being with free will, if God knows what he's going to do tomorrow at 12 noon, then God is powerless to change his mind today. He is stuck. He is trapped. That puts limits on his freedom. It puts limits on his power as well. If God goes ahead and changes his mind tomorrow and does what he wants to, then that means he was not omniscient. You can't have both omniscience, knowing the future, and be a free being. And there are many other examples of how you can disprove not only the non-existence of such a God, but the impossibility of the existence of such a God. Of course, it depends on what definition you pick. Many theologians come along and tinker with those characteristics to try to say, well, then, God doesn't really know the future. He only knows what is knowable. And you find theologians trying to change this or that or, 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 and so on. So uh, we don't have an actual co coherent definition of what this being is that you're arguing for. What are we talking about? What is this being? What's it made out of? What is, what is the substance of spirit? What is it? Is it? Are there spiritual atoms? Are there spiritual what? What is it? If it's just a concept, concepts don't exist in the real world, then God, God can't exist because he's just a concept. Fourth, there are no good arguments for a God. Most of those arguments we hear are really negatives. They're not positive arguments for something. Like if people who are prayed for were healed more than those who don't, there would be something positive, right? But in fact, when we do those studies, we see that nothing fails like prayer. Prayer has the same rate as, as random chance. If it did, if prayer really worked, that would revolutionize medicine and science. It would change everything. But of course we know that prayer is just an anecdotal thing of wishful thinking. What we do is we count the hits and we ignore the misses. You can pray a hundred times and 99 out of a hundred nothing happens, but then that one time something happens, yes, God answered my prayer, right? Well, that's just random chance. If we had any good evidence or good arguments, we could talk about them, but instead what we have are absences of arguments. What we have are how do you explain the fine-tuning? That's basically not an argument from evidence. It's an argument from ignorance. I don't know. It's an argument from personal incredulity. How could that be? There must be a God. That's basically what this boils down to. Another point to make is that if there is a God, why is there no agreement among believers as to the nature of this God or the moral principles of this God? If there's a God, shouldn't it be one God for everybody and there's the rules and there's what we know and we all know what it is and it's clear? Uh, if we were going to go to a theocratic government, should it be Shia or should it be Sunni? Which one should it be? Which one should we pick? People are killing each other over it from the same book. Catholics and Protestants. Killing each Protestants killing Protestants. Uh, uh, Martin Luther having somebody killed for blasphemy. John Calvin having another Calvinist friend of his killed, burned at the stake because of, of blasphemy and heresy. There's no agreement among believers, and if you take the basic moral issues of the world that we're all struggling with right now, you would expect that believers would have a clear answer, but they don't. Believers in any holy book don't have a clear absolute moral guideline. There are no actual, you know, except for the clear cut, should I, should I burn this baby with a cigarette or shouldn't I? Wow, what a big moral dilemma, right? I mean, that's not a problem. We, have, we, we all realize that what we want to do is eliminate or minimize harm. 
I mean, that's what we want to do. That's what morality means. It's no big mystery like there's some huge, oh, what is the objective moral authority for morality? Well, there is none. What it comes down to is, is that little baby going to be burned or not? It comes down to us living our lives in a real world with real harm and real pain and real suffering. How do we try to minimize and avoid that? So putting a morality with a big capital M as if it were some big mystery uh, is just answering one mystery with another mystery because you still haven't given us any evidence for this God. Another argument is that there are no good replies to a lot of the positive arguments against the existence of a God assuming that God is good, assuming that God is defined as a good being. If God is defined as a cruel, capricious monster, well then perhaps he does exist. Look around, look at nature, look at human nature, look at the disasters, look at the, the natural evils that happen, and look at the human evils that happen. Look at headlines in that. The problem of evil is one of the, was one of the big ones. If there is a good God and he doesn't take care of evil, uh, regardless of whether we have free will or not, uh, there's an argument right there against the existence of an all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-caring God. We can all think of examples of why people who prayed, people who prayed desperately for God's protection and yet they were killed or hurt at the same rate as random chance as anybody else. All you have to do is walk into any children's hospital anywhere in the world and you know there's no God. Every theologian that I know admits that that's a big thorn in the side of the likelihood of the existence of a good God. Of course, God might be a demon, in which case that problem goes away, right? But I don't think you, you people are worshiping a demon of a God, except those of you who believe in a God who created a hell, a hell where people are physically tormented because they don't think the same way. Um, in the Bible, that Jesus talked about this lake of fire that burned forever. I have to say, any system of thought that makes its point or tries to persuade with a threat of physical violence, as the Bible does and as the Quran does, is a morally bankrupt system. You should persuade with your lives. You should persuade, you know, if, if Adam would just forget about the Quran and just persuade me that he's a Muslim by his good works, I would be impressed. I think Adam's probably a good guy. I would listen to that. I would look at his life. I would look at his good deeds and I would say, wow, he's got something that I admire. But then when he puts a book under my nose that has this threat of physical violence that my skin's going to burn and I'm going to suffer benumbing cold and that the true believers, the Muslims, are going to sit on these purple couches looking down and laughing at those of us. You're going to be laughing at me. That's what the Quran says. You will be laughing at me because I'm suffering. Because why? What was my crime? That I had the temerity to think for myself and not choose to worship and admire this deity that you think is amazing? That is moral bankruptcy. That is not a good argument for a god. You should do what Thomas Jefferson did. He took a pair of scissors to the Bible and he cut out the crap. Uh, he didn't use the word crap, he used the word dunghill, but it's the same thing. He cut out the crap and he said, okay, there's some good teachings here, let's keep those. There's good teachings in Islam. There are great people in Islam. But I think the teachings that all the religions have in the world Sikhism, Judaism, Hinduism, those values that we all share in common are human values. They are humanistic values. The fact that we all share them in all religions points to their natural humanistic origin, not to, uh, to some transcendent origin. Finally, um, there's no need for belief in a God. Millions of good people all over the planet live happy, productive, meaningful, moral lives, loving lives, without a belief in a God. To say otherwise is discriminatory and prejudicial. To say otherwise would be offensive. Uh, I, people say that about me all the time. They wonder, as an atheist, do you love your children? You know, like, what, I'm not a human being or something? Like, like somehow we lack something? We non-believers don't lack a thing. You believers don't have anything special. You have nothing special. I, it, would be, it would be arrogant of me, and I would never do this, but suppose I were to argue I play jazz piano and it's a wonderful feeling. Or, or suppose Adam and I both said to you who don't play, you know what, we have something that's pretty amazing and special and you poor people who don't play jazz piano, you don't have what we have, this is special. I'm not gonna insist that the rest of you have to practice piano for four hours a day, right, in order to have meaning in your life. Well, that would be arrogant of me. I know you Muslims have something special. Christians and Jews and other three people have something special, but you don't have any corner on compassion or meaning or beauty or morality there is no need for a belief in a God.